As with every major religion, the appearance of Christianity in the Roman Empire led to an upheaval of an enormous proportion and changed the social, economic and political life of the empire forever. However, this change started out slow and started growing only after a certain number of Greeks converted from their ancient beliefs to the new religion. But how was Greece Christianized? Our video will try to answer this question. In those days, the stars in the sky held great divine significance, and even today there are special sights to behold. That's why the sponsor of this video, Under Lucky Stars, provides beautiful star maps from a chosen time and place to commemorate an important point in your life. It features all of the stars and constellations that were above you at your chosen moment on a high-quality print map. These make excellent personalized gifts with your choice of 15 designs, custom message and title, and size on museum quality art paper, plus one of six frames. They're durable too, designed to last for generations. NASA astrophysicists have verified the accuracy of their mapping methods, and Under Lucky Stars supports the International Dark Sky Association, committed to protecting our view of the cosmos from light pollution and space debris. Surprise a loved one or celebrate one of your special moments with Under Lucky Stars. Plus, we can offer an exclusive discount. Go to underluckystars.com slash kingsandgenerals and use our code kingsandgenerals to get 10% off. The history of Christianity in Greece begins with the Apostle Paul, who around 49 AD traveled to Philippi, Thessaloniki and Veria, preached the Gospel of Christ and formed the first small Christian communities in Europe. On his second journey, he preached at Athens, where according to church tradition, he converted a member of the Athenian Areopagus, the judicial council named Dionysius, who, after his conversion, became the first bishop of Athens. The formation of these early Christian communities, however, didn't mean that the entire population became Christian overnight. Christianization would be a long process that would last centuries, and oftentimes it took more than preaching to convince the followers of the old gods to abandon them. The Edict of Milan in 313 that granted religious freedom and Constantine's conversion were monumental events that boosted Christianity's popularity and led to many mass conversions. Though the new religion was already popular in the previous centuries, mainly at urban centers, and had remarkable growth rates even at times of persecutions. But contrary to what some Christian sources claim, their victory wasn't complete in the 4th century, and paganism, especially in the area of Greece, showed some tenacity and signs of life during the 4th, 5th and 6th centuries. In some extreme cases, pagan practices remained in some areas well into the Middle Ages. Christianity's progress in Greece was inhibited by a number of factors. Greece was an economic backwater and held a secondary position to the empire's economic and political life compared to the eastern provinces. There was thus less incentive from central authorities to dispatch numerous missionaries to convert the local populace. The many and strong academies and philosophical schools were also a prohibiting factor as they cultivated pagan beliefs. And finally, the lack of monasteries until the 8th century with the notable exception being the area around Thessaloniki, which, not coincidentally, had a larger Christian following. The monks might not have been able to convert the people with a simple wallalo, but they were pious and exceptionally zealous, and thus constituted the perfect frontline soldiers of Christ, traveling to villages and bearing many dangers to preach the gospel and convert the local population and their effectiveness could be seen in the way and speed with which they converted Western Asia Minor, though it should be noted that rural pagan populations existed there even at the time of Justinian I. It seems that paganism still exerted some influence in his time, if we are to believe the magnitude and harshness by which contemporary sources like John Malalas or John of Ephesus describe Justinian's pagan persecutions. However, these accounts should be taken with a grain of salt as they tend to exaggerate events, either for personal gain or to depict Justinian in a darker tone. For example, John of Ephesus claims that he converted around 70 to 80,000 pagans in Asia Minor alone. A most notable act, especially concerning our focus on the region of Greece, was the shutting of the Neoplatonic Academy of Athens, an important intellectual center of the time that, through its teaching, propagated pagan beliefs. 
Athens might have been one of the first cities with a Christian community, but by the 4th century it remained pagan to a large degree thanks to the great religious festivals like the Panathenaia and the Eleusinian Mysteries, and because it was the beating heart of ancient Greek Paideia, housing many Neoplatonic philosophers. For the festivities dedicated to the patron goddess of the city, Athena, the Panathenaia, we know they took place well into the 4th century from the orator Hermerius, who in 362 served as personal secretary to Emperor Julian the Apostate. Himerius declares how nice it was to see the festival and to talk about it with the Hellenes, and also gives a description of the procession, but he isn't the only source. An inscription from the late 4th or early 5th century informs us that a sophist, possibly Plutarch of Athens, a new Platonic philosopher who was the leader of the Platonic Academy, paid three times for the sacred ship of the goddess. A major difference between the ancient Panathenaea and those held in the 4th century would have been the lack of animal sacrifice, as it was banned by Constantine the Great first, and later Theodosius I reiterated this law. The ban on public sacrifices, at least in the time of Theodosius, aimed more to suppress public ceremonies. Private sacrifices seemed to be above the law and continued to take place, especially in cities like Athens that had a large pagan following although eventually legislation became stricter. More popular than the Panathenaea seemed to be the Eleusinian Mysteries that attracted visitors not only from Athens, but from all of Greece. In fact, they were so popular that the Christian bishop, Asterius of Amasia, in his Encomium on All the Martyrs, complained that the entirety of Athens and Greece gathers to celebrate them. Among the big crowd were famous individuals, and especially Neoplatonic philosophers who supported mystic cults. Even Emperor Julian had become an initiate of the mysteries, and had performed secret rites with the Eleusinian Hierophant. The pagan renaissance under Julian's reign wouldn't last long, however, and this fact seems to have been known to people with religious authority. We are informed from the works of the philosopher and historian Eunapius that he himself had asked the Hierophant about the future of Eleusis and paganism in general, to which the man replied with a grim prophecy. He stated that he was the last legitimate Hierophant, his successor would not be an Athenian of the family of Eumolpidae, but a Thespian who was a priest of Mithras and had no right to touch the high priest's throne. He also foretold that during this fake Hierophant's time, the temples would be razed to the ground and religious tradition would no longer be observed. If such a prophecy truly occurred, it is probable that the Eumolpidid Hierophant, who likely was Nestorius, one of Julian's counsellors, had in mind that it would be the local Christians that would bring the downfall of the temples and the old religion. In fact, it would be Alaric and his Goths that would destroy Eleusis in 396. But where the old gods died, the new god would come into place. The Christians completely demolished the ancient site and reused stones and sculptures for the construction of new buildings, including a small church dedicated to Saint Zachariah. A standard practice that was followed when repurposing pagan materials was the inscription of crosses, kairos, and other Christian symbols so as to purify them out of the demonic pagan spirit that once lived in them. Naturally, this practice couldn't be exempt from the Christian site at Eleusis. A more well-known repurposement of an ancient temple to a Christian basilica was that of the Temple of Athena, the Parthenon. We're not sure for the exact date the temple was converted to a church, but surviving pieces of the early basilica are dated to the 5th and early 6th centuries. We know, however, that it was still in use by 432 by the writings of Marinus, who recorded that his teacher Proclus, after arriving in Athens from Alexandria, immediately went to the temple only to find the doorkeeper closing it. Three days later, Emperor Theodosius II ordered the closure of the temple for good when he decreed that all pagan temples in the eastern part of the empire should be closed. It is very likely, however, that the closure of the Parthenon was postponed and not put into practice until much later, with possible dates being the years 481 to 484, during the reign of Emperor Zeno, who too ordered the closure of the remaining temples. When the Parthenon passed into Christian hands, it had of course to conform to Christian architecture and was remodeled accordingly. 
Like all Christian churches, it had to face the east, so it was reorientated and the entrance was placed on the building's west side. The Christian altar and iconostasis were put next to an apse where the earlier pronaus was once located. Walls were erected between the columns of the Epistodomus and the Peristyle. The treasury of the Parthenon became the narthex of the church and a gniconitis was created with a wooden floor. Icons were painted on the walls and Christian inscriptions were carved on the temple's columns. It doesn't take a lot to imagine that some of the sculptures were damaged since they depicted pagan scenes, but surprisingly some survived and were maintained as part of the new church. Those included the east and west pediments that depicted the famous contest between Athena and Poseidon over the city and the goddess's birth as well as a large portion of the Panathenic frieze. The same fate was met by numerous temples throughout Athens and generally in Greece, as the size of the Christian population kept on rising and that of the pagans kept on dwindling. Erechtheion, which is also on the rock of the Acropolis, was also converted to a three-isled basilica sometime in the 6th or 7th century, though it had probably been abandoned much earlier than that. Other examples include the Temple of Hephaestus, also known as the Seon, the Asclepeion, and the Harion of Samos. Conversion of their sacred sites certainly wasn't a pleasant view for the remaining pagans of the time. The alternative, though, was a far more cruel fate – the total destruction of the temples. Whether it was barbarian invasions, natural causes such as fires and earthquakes, or Christian mobs, by the end of the 5th century, many of the great pagan centers like Delphi, Olympia, Dodone, Nemea, and Epidaurus had been destroyed. Plenty of statues had the same end. Some of them were left in place after their destruction, but a great number of them were thrown in rivers, wells, and drains, or placed face down to ridicule them and the demons they represented. Some of the luckiest statues were repurposed to be used in churches after, of course, the spirits that once lived in them were exorcised with the inscriptions of crosses on them. And where temples and statues were demolished, basilicas and crosses would be erected to mark Christian victory. Usually the church was near the pagan site, as the site itself was still considered unclean, but there are examples of basilicas built directly on top of ruins, or of temples remaining intact and being repurposed as Christian churches. It wasn't just the sacred sites that were transformed. Local gods and rites underwent Christianization. Chthonic deities and guardian spirits were replaced by saints, angels, and martyrs. The continuation of cults, albeit under Christian terminology, and the usage of familiar titles was a tactic that eased the transfer of religious allegiance, as it presented a familiar image to the convert. Additionally, and though not all emperors were so keen to persecute the pagans, the generally increasingly harsher policy of the Eastern Empire towards them, as well as the social pressure the Christian population exerted as it constituted the majority, forced many pagans to abandon the old traditions and adopt the Christian god. Incredibly enough, a small community of pagans survived well until the Middle Ages. These were the Maniots or Maniates, the inhabitants of the Mani Peninsula in western Laconia and eastern Messenia. From De Administrando Imperio of the Emperor Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus, we read, Be it known that the inhabitants of Castle Minor are not from the race of aforesaid Slavs, Malingoi and Azeritai dwelling on the Tegetus, but from the older Romaioi who up to the present time are termed Hellenes by the local inhabitants, on account of their being in olden times idolaters and worshippers of idols like the ancient Greeks, who were baptized and became Christians in the reign of the glorious Basil. It seems, though, that the Maniots didn't fully embrace the new religion at that time, as a century after Basil's reign we have the account of a Byzantine monk named Nikon the Metanoite. From his hagiographic life, we learn that he toured the Peloponnese, visiting many villages, building a plethora of churches, and leading multitudes to conversion. Another account is that of a Georgian monk in Mount Athos called George the Hagirite, who lived in the 11th century. According to his Athenite biography, one day he passed through the remote village of Livadia, which was within the perimeter of the holy mountain. There he found that the inhabitants, who were Bulgars, worshipped an old effigy made out of marble and depicting a woman. 
The statue was quite probably from late antiquity, and the Bulgars who had escaped the Christianization efforts of the empire had found and appropriated its usage, but that didn't stop the monk from smashing it and putting an end to the pagan cult there. The Maniots were the last pagan community in the region of Greece. However, the title of the last Hellene belongs to Iohius Yemistus Pletho, one of the most prominent philosophers of the late Byzantine era. In his work, Nomi, he rejects Christianity and supports a return to the worship of the classical Hellenic gods. This was, however, nothing more than the wishful thinking of an old man, as by that time, the old gods were but a distant memory even for the Manietes. More videos on the history of Greece and various religions are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.